everyone, and welcome to our two-day series of webinars entitled Bicontinental Perspectives on Legislative Drafting. My name is Kimberly Faith, and I am this year's Chair of the International Conference on Legislation and Law Reform. This conference focuses on how laws are written in the United States and around the world at the international, national, and subnational levels. In normal times, we hold it about every one to two years, but as many of you already know, we had planned to host an in-person conference this October, but it was unavoidably postponed due to COVID-19 and the associated international travel restrictions. So this series of webinars features several renowned experts on legislative drafting who were invited to speak at the in-person conference, but were unable to do so. We wouldn't have been able to put this webinar series together if it weren't for the incredible folks over at the University of Pennsylvania at Cary School of Law. I want to particularly thank Professor Lou Rooley and events coordinator Naoshi Giles for all of the behind the scenes work that they have done. I'd also like to take a minute to thank the entire body of conference organizers. We are a group of 16 attorneys that volunteer our time so that we can provide a sense of community and an outlet for scholarship for the international community of legislative professionals. These individuals have put in an extraordinary amount of time over the last year and will continue to do so, both on the webinars and on the next in-person conference once it is safe for us to gather again. Our presentation today will be exploring the ethics and politics of legislative drafting. As an aside, I am especially proud to have been part of organizing this presentation because our speaker was actually my professor in law school, so it feels as though things have come full circle. Introducing our speaker and moderating the session today will be Professor Sean Keeley of Boston University School of Law. Sean spent his career in the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office and then as legal counsel to the Massachusetts Legislators Joint Committee on Criminal Justice and Joint Committee on Revenue. He now directs Boston University School of Law's Legislative Policy and Drafting Clinic, giving students hands-on experience working with clients seeking to advance a bill or project through the state legislature. So Sean, thank you so much for moderating. Um, and everyone, be sure to stick around after, after the presentation is over for a short virtual networking session. And with that, I will turn it over to Sean. Thanks so much, Kim. Welcome from Plymouth County, Massachusetts, where the leaves are falling, the cranberries have been harvested, and it's a great day to talk about legislation. We will hear from today's speaker for 30 minutes. And if you have a question, please use the Zoom question and answer function on your toolbar. And please keep your question topical and appropriate. And then I'll pose the question to our speaker after his presentation. I'm thrilled to introduce today's speaker, Professor David Marcello, the Executive Director of the Public Law Center at Tulane Law School, which is located in one of the great cities of the world, New Orleans, Louisiana. Professor Marcello has been involved in public interest law throughout his career. Shortly after graduating from law school, he founded the first statewide advocacy group to protect the environment in Louisiana. He has worked for the mayor of New Orleans and worked with the Regional Transit Authority. Today, through his legislative and administrative ad advocacy clinic, uh, his graduate law students draft bills on behalf of various clients. He's a professor known in many parts of the world, having taught legislative drafting in Europe, Africa, and in the Caribbean, and many more legislative drafters know him from his annual International Legislative Drafting Institute at Tulane Law School. It's my true pleasure to welcome Professor David Marcello. Well, thank you, Sean, and thanks, Kim, for having me uh, to this great conference. Congratulations to all of you who have worked to put it together. And hopefully uh, a year from now, we'll all be together in person rather than remotely. Um, I'm going to try to get right into this with the share screen function um, because we've got a lot of ground to cover. Let's see here, there's my button. So today's topic, ethics and politics of legislative drafting is a subject that I first addressed in the 1990s. And I used my home state of Louisiana as a case study. You will find a lot of Louisiana-based observations still a part of this presentation. And the reason that I think that still works is because the presentation deals with what I consider to be universal conditions of drafting. Whether you work in a unicameral or a bicameral legislative system, 
in a parliamentary or the US enactment process, whether you're drafting for a national or a sub-national legislative body, my thesis is the same. The legislative drafting process is political. And what drafters do is inescapably at some level subjective. Drafters are repeatedly called upon to make political and policy choices in performing their jobs. Now, this is clearly in conflict with that stereotypical notion that we've all encountered of the drafter as scribe, faithfully committing to writing the policy positions appropriately reached by elected officials. I don't believe it's as simple as that. I believe ethics on the one hand and politics on the other are constantly exerting a pull and a tug on each other with ethics bidding for objectivity and the political side of life being a more subjective realm. If that thesis is well-founded, it has profound implications for transparency, professional ethics, and representative government. Transparency, because drafters cannot be held accountable for what their clients cannot see. Um, decisions made by a drafter off the radar screen are unreviewable, an exercise of unfettered discretion. Professional ethics are violated when drafters usurp what ought to be an informed decision by a client, and representative government is not well served when an unelected drafting staffer makes policy decisions that ought to be made by an elected official. So to illustrate these points, I'm going to rely on a, um, an anecdote from the 1991 legislative session. Um, actually, there's the slide we need. And here's the drafter's ethical dilemma. In the spring 1991 legislative session, a green governor, a rarity in Louisiana, Buddy Romer, has appointed a very vigorous Department of Environmental Quality to look out for the condition of the state's environment. And DEQ has issued a regulation to regulate the runoff of cow manure into the state's scenic waterways. North of Lake Pontchartrain, which is on the northern border of New Orleans, there are a lot of dairy farms. And those dairy farms were sending the fecal coliform count in Louisiana's scenic river system up and up and up. DEQ said, we're gonna regulate that. And the legislative response was, we're gonna revoke DEQ's regulatory authority. And so they turn to you as a drafter and they say, draft us a bill to repeal this law by which this meddlesome agency attempts to run off, uh, regulate the runoff of cow manure. Well, what do you do? If you are a closet environmentalist as the drafter, you think, well, I'll do exactly what I've been asked to do. I'll draft a bill because I know that that bill is going to have to go to the governor. It's going to sail through the House and the Senate, but it's going to go to the, the governor and Buddy Romer will veto it. He's a good, strong environmentalist. And if you draft a bill, that is exactly what happens. Now, if on the other hand, you, the drafter, are a card carrying member of the Louisiana Farm Bureau, and you've done your homework, and you know that in Louisiana, the Constitution provides that a concurrent resolution through the House and the Senate, without ever reaching the governor's desk, can suspend the law for a year and two months, time enough to come back and deal with it in the next legislative session. You might go to the client and say, you know, this idea of drafting a bill, that's not such a good idea. That's not really what you want to do. You want to revoke DEQ's authority, let's pass a resolution instead. It'll never reach Romer's desk because resolutions don't go to the governor. And a year from now, who knows? There's an election in the fall. The governor might not get reelected. So here's your ethical dilemma. What do you do? Do you draft the bill as you've been asked to do it? And is it political if you do that? I think it is. Do you instead go to your client and say, you don't want a bill, you want a resolution, and here's why. Is that political? I think it is. I think it's political either way. And knowing that there is a governor's race coming up in the fall brings another level of political calculation to the table. Because in fact, in the fall of 1991, Buddy Romer ran third in the governor's race, leaving Louisiana with what we called, not fondly, the race from hell. Edwin Edwards versus David Duke. Edwin Edwards was a bit of a rake, had a reputation as a 
ladies man and a bit of a scoundrel. Um, David Duke was even worse. He was a an imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. These were our choices. Um, here's what one of our columnists had to say about the runoff from hell. Edwin Edwards is a twice indicted womanizing gambler. And I never thought that would sound so good to me, she added. So faced with this choice, we came up with a great bumper sticker. Vote for the crook. It's important. This must be unique in the annals of American politics. And in fact, Edwards did get elected. Um, Edwards was no environmentalist. You might call him an oil governor, not a green governor. And so a year later, you could have come back and passed the legislation that you sought in 1991 with no fear that Edwin Edwards would veto it. My point here is that it's politics, top to bottom. It infiltrates what drafters do. We can't insulate ourselves from it as much as we much li uh, might like to. Let's look at steps in drafting that at some point or another, every one of us as drafters have to deal with information gathering and policy choices and so on and so forth. I've numbered them because we're going to come back to them periodically. These are taken from Reed Dickerson's book, Fundamentals of Legal Drafting. And um, they, again, illustrate the extent to which drafters operate in a political environment and are frequently called upon to exercise some degree of subjectivity. Uh, it's a comment here from Robert Martineau's book, um, Drafting Legislation and Rules in Plain English. Martineau says that in the drafting process itself is when policy is developed. And that at the earliest stages, almost every word chosen by the drafter reflects a policy choice. So how is the drafter supposed to deal with this challenge? Go and ask your client in every instance, here's a word choice, I need your feedback on it. How practical is that? How often are legislators complicitous in their own um, erosion of authority by not being readily available to drafters? Well, here is Martineau's advice to dealing with this difficult situation. The conscientious drafter should first either consult with the proponent or choose a word that reflects a choice and then bring it to the attention of the proponent, explain the alternatives and why the draft is selected one reflected in the draft and then be directed by the choice made by the proponent. This is an ideal in quotes and not one uh, well implemented, at least in our legislative process where there is never enough time to get everything done. So let's look at other factors that might impede the ideal drafting dialogue. I'm going to dwell for a moment first on personal considerations. We've looked at an example of political influences, the difference between the drafter who's a closet environmentalist and the drafter who is a member of the Farm Bureau. And we'll look at time constraints and abusive practices uh, a bit more in a moment. But first on the personal dimension, the Public Law Center in the 1992 legislative session brought a bill to uh, suspend the licenses of, in this case, a divorced dad, um, to enforce their child support obligations. This sounds counterintuitive. You know, you're a plumber or an electrician, you're behind on your child support payments. We're going to take away the license that enables you to earn money. The point is that you're dealing with somebody who is in contempt of court, who has seriously gone deficient, serious business is called for. But the point about the remedy is that it is not likely to be embraced, this bill, by a drafter who's married to a divorced dad with second family kids. You'll have to indulge me the gender-based observation here. This is, in fact, how the hypothetical presented itself to us. I'll call the drafter Mary. And um, we know that in the third decade of the third millennium, the divorced dad might be of either gender and likewise, the second wife might be of either gender. But um, those observations are not central to the main point, which is the drafter, the quote unquote, second wife with second family kids is not likely to like the bill. Is it okay for her not to like the bill? Well, sure, she doesn't have to like it. 
Is it okay for her to convey her distaste to legislators? Uh, probably not very appropriate. Okay to draft without attention to detail? That would be a shortfall on professional responsibility. And would it be okay to alert divorced dad's advocacy group to the existence of this bill? Well, that in fact would violate a very explicit American Bar Association rule. Um, a uh, lawyer shall not reveal information relating to representation of a client unless the client consents after consultation. And this requirement of maintaining confidentiality applies to government lawyers who may disagree with policy goals that their representation is attempting to advance. So how to get around this challenge of subjectivity? Well, one um, drafting office in the Midwest, they'll remain anonymous by request, said, we'll do a priorities chart. We're gonna minimize the personal, the political and the temporal influences by putting down in writing just how we're gonna assign responsibilities to draft legislation in our, in our office. We prioritize. And I said, when the drafter commenting after my remarks informed me of this, I said, I really wanna see that chart. So he sent it to me and here's a shortened version of it. The high priority items are when you're asked to redraft the prior bill, or you're presented with a good working draft, you've got a well-reasoned request, little or no research is required, minimal drafting time. Well, what's the underlying value behind this supposedly objective list of priorities? I suggest it's about maximizing the efficient use of the drafter's time. Suppose I said instead, we ought to make our office work to provide the public and legislators with a service that they could not easily secure elsewhere. Then the priorities in the right column would become high priorities. Draft original bills, you've got no working draft, you've got a poorly reasoned request, maybe from a legislator's constituent, they know they got a problem, they're not great at framing the issue. You've got to do that work. If you accept the burden of providing a service that isn't easily found elsewhere, these priorities flip. So it's political either way, in the sense that there are values underlying this priority chart. It's not objective or policy neutral. So let's move on to policy choices, uh, Dickerson's drafting step number two. And I suggest to you here, there is a conflict of interest in the drafter who asking more questions of a legislator will inevitably get more answers and um, there'll be less drafter discretion. If you don't ask a lot of questions, you'll be a drafter who's empowered more. Um, and I have put the second bullet point here to raise a question about members. Do legislators always make themselves available? And if not, are they complicitous in their own surrender of policymaking authority? So um, what we might look at here is this seesaw effect the drafter who loads up that end of the seesaw with questions and gets lots of answers, elevates and empowers the legislator. The drafter who follows the opposite approach and asks fewer questions, elevates the drafter's discretion. So, you know, we can toggle between who's in the ascendancy, the drafter or the legislator. My advice to legislators is work with drafters um, and make sure that you keep your hands on the policy making process. Research methods. In the 1940s, the American Bar Association did a fascinating um, research program, drafting project. They had their drafters keep meticulous time records and they did original research, everything from scratch. Well, here's what they wound up with at the end. The research time took 58 out of 80 hours total conference time, talking to each other, 18 hours, the writing was only about 5%, four hours. What this tells me is that drafters often cannot afford the time it takes to do original research. How might you apply a quick fix to that problem? Well, you might go ask an expert to fill you in. I'm here to suggest that the choice of an expert, again, is not a value neutral choice. Um, this is a paragraph from the Fisher and Urey text, getting the yes. The text itself is about negotiation strategy. 
but I think it brings something useful to this concept that different experts give different advice. In thinking up possible solutions to a dispute over custody of a child, look at the problem as it might be seen by an educator or a banker, a psychiatrist, a civil rights lawyer, a minister, a nutritionist, a doctor, a feminist, a football coach, or someone with another special point of view. The point here is that drafters should not make the decision to consult an expert off the radar screen. They need to let that be a decision made by an informed client. Here's another issue, where to put enforcement responsibility. In Louisiana, if you place the law in the realm of the Department of Natural Resources, you're going to get an enforcement agency that's all about exploiting the state's resources. So if your bill is an environmental bill, that's not a good location for it. If on the other hand, you place it with environmental quality, they're all about protecting the environment. So where you put the law makes a great deal of difference. I'm always reminded at this point in the presentation about one of Louisiana's earlier governors, Earl Long, Huey's younger brother who became governor in the 1950s and had an attorney general that he didn't think too much of named Jack P.F. Grimion. Earl Long said of Jack Grimion, if you want to hide something from Jack Grimion, put it in a law book. So remember that when you're thinking about where to put something in the law. Here's a matter that might fall more or less entirely in the realm of the drafter to decide the balance between statutory and regulatory detail. We have the choice to draft a self-executing statute that is complete unto itself. All of the details are addressed at a statutory level by legislative enactment. Or we can draft legislation that is more general and leaves room for subordinate legislation, or as we would call it in the US, agency regulations, to be elaborated, promulgated, by the agency. This empowers the administrative branch of government. The self-executing statute empowers the legislative branch. Statutes are harder to change than in our system regulations. So there are gigantic political implications here about whether the legislature is gonna retain a tight control or whether it's going to give more control to the executive administrative side of government. So it's a very political decision, and it is a decision that drafters could quite conceivably make more or less on their own in the privacy of their office while they are drafting the instrument. Um, there's another hugely important event in the US political process, and that is committee assignment. Who gets to hear your bill, what committee it gets assigned to has an immense implication in terms of how easy or difficult it will be to pass the bill. So another example from the Public Law Center's uh, experiences in 1992, we wanted to draft a bill to help welfare recipients, or rather people who had applied for welfare benefits and been denied. The law allowed them to appeal to the courts for reconsideration of their denial. But the exclusive venue, the only place you could file that lawsuit was in Baton Rouge, the state capital and the agency's domicile. Well, this was burdensome from a geographical standpoint. Um, people in New Orleans or Lake Charles or Shreveport at the four corners of Louisiana were not well served by having their lawyers have to drive to Baton Rouge in order to plead their case. So we introduced the bill, House Bill 1215, to create dual venue. You could sue either at the domicile of the agency, the Department of Social Services, or you could sue at the domicile of the applicant. I'd a lot rather have it filed in my jurisdiction and for reasons that had to do with more than just geographic convenience. In Louisiana, we elect judges. If you wanna accept for the moment the concept of hometown justice, you'd a lot rather have your case tried before a judge who you had helped to elect or might help to unelect. And this was a political implication that was certainly appreciated by us in bringing the bill. And it was appreciated by our sponsor who was a Lake Charles legislator 
lived quite a distance from the Capitol, knew that his constituents would be well served by creating dual venue. Um, this sponsor happened to be as well, the chair of a house committee. So we brought our bill to the, um, the um, drafter who worked for the health and welfare committee. And after she'd completed the draft, um, she attached a keyword to it, health and welfare. Now we've got in Louisiana, a keyword guide. This is an ancient copy of it. I'm sure it's online now. It's um, 105 pages, I think, of um, everything from abortion to zoning keywords that will have a lot to do with the committee to which the bill gets assigned. This keyword of health and welfare pretty much guaranteed that the bill would go to the health and welfare committee. That wasn't a good assignment for us. Those are mostly non-lawyers. They're people who deal with the Department of Social Services day in and day out. They were not a favorable forum for our bill. Our legislator, on the other hand, chaired the House Committee on Civil Law and Procedure. And I knew that if we could get it into his committee, our chances of getting it issued as a favorable report went up immeasurably. It was a highly political event. So I turned to Beth and I said, you know, is there an alternative um, keyword that we might consider using. And she consulted the keyword index and she came back with civil procedure venue. I said, that's great, let's use this. And with the stroke of a pen or a keystroke, she changed it. And that became the keyword on our bill and our bill got assigned to our legislators committee and our bill got reported favorably and ultimately enacted. This raises a lot of political questions. I mean, number one, this was a conversation that was on no one's radar screen. It was me and Beth in her office. Number two, it was a decision that she made on her own without checking with anyone. Number three, it's a substantive change in how the bill is described. So let's take each of those in turn. Do I have a problem ethically? I think not. I am obviously an advocate for my clients. This will help my clients. I'm doing what they're pleading with me to do, helping them pass the bill. Is it a problem for Beth? Well, I think that depends on your examination of these two keywords. Um, arguably, civil procedure venue is more specific, more informative, more helpful in telling people what this bill is about in a generic category like health and welfare. Now, was it political to make that change? It had huge political implications. And again, it was a change made by the drafter in the privacy of her office as the outgrowth of our conversation. The process is very political and drafters are part of that process. Amendments. In Louisiana, we used to have a reprehensible approach called amendments in concept. I'll give you the language later, just vote for it now. Well, this hypothetical is actually drawn from experience. Um, my friend who was a lawyer, was staffing a committee and a legislator up on the dais was waving around some papers in his hands and describing what his amendment was about. And his colleagues on the committee approved the amendment. The legislator went down from the dais to my friend, CB, and he gave him the uh, documents and he said, here's the amendment, put it in the bill. Well, CB compared what he'd been handed with what had been described and what the committee had voted for. And he said, I can't do that. This isn't what they voted for. The legislator said, just do it. And CB said, well, do you want me to read out loud to them what this proposed amendment would say? At which point the legislator backed down and my friend had to take a fairly stern stance to accomplish a good result. Um, but had he not done so, he would have perpetrated a fraud on the committee it would have challenged the integrity of the legislative system and process. So sometimes drafters have to stand up and be um, political, if you will, in the service of right functioning. Legislative history. Here is a, um, an excerpt from Blanchard versus Bergeron, uh, and it's uh, from Justice Scalia's opinion. It's a sort of a sneer at legislative drafting staff for being manipulative in the use of committee history. And um, Scalia's point, which I really cannot dispute, 
is that committee staff members frequently get the opportunity to insert into a report language that will later be influential when courts are interpreting the law. And um, uh, should they be able to do that? Well, I'm gonna give you an anecdote involving uh, the former Dean of Tulane Law School, John Kramer, who before he came down to New Orleans was a staffer on Capitol Hill. And John was assigned to draft um, with regard to the Food Stamp Act. John Kramer knew this was gonna be the largest income transfer legislation in the history of the country. And he wrote to his friends in legal services and public interest. And he said, you're gonna to have to grapple with eligibility questions. So I'm gonna ask you to send me your questions and I'm gonna answer them in the report. And he did that. And in fact, the Q and A in the committee report proved to be very influential in making the Food Stamp Act very generous and handing out benefits. Was it right or wrong for John to do that? Well, I'll leave you to consider that, but it was surely effective. We're now moving into ethics and I'm not gonna dwell very long in this area. Um, a lot of these concepts that I'm describing today are discussed in an article I did in the Tulane Law Review back in 1995, 96. Um, it's available on the Social Science Research Network. And I always like to mention SSRN.com, just in case everybody isn't familiar with it. Um, it's a great resource. I used to say it's where old law professors, old articles went to die like an elephant graveyard, but that's a bad metaphor. It's actually where old articles go to get new life. So if you haven't already encountered SSRN.com, go get familiar with it. Are lawyers bound by more restrictive ethics rules? Yes, unquestionably. Here are some examples of them. Duties of candor toward the tribunal. Um, lobbyists are not governed by these same restrictions, non-lawyer lobbyists. Is that fair? Well, why should we regulate lawyers more severely? Are they less trustworthy? I happen to believe not. Um, Lawyers actually have three advantages when they appear before a legislative committee. I think we enjoy certain credibility advantages when we're dealing with law formation. So that's a plus for us. We've also got certain special privileges, lawyer client confidentiality. We can't be forced to disclose things. And we are officers of the legal system sworn to uphold and defend its integrity. So if we have to operate under somewhat more severe constraints, I think that's an acceptable trade-off. Should non-lawyer drafters adhere to lawyers' ethics? Well, I think it might be prudent to do so. It would not only protect the integrity of the law formation process, but it would protect non-lawyer drafters from ethics problems in performing their duties. You would need to know that you are responsible for what your subordinates do and that you can be held accountable for their ethical breaches. And your subordinates need to know that they can't just be ordered to do something that is ethically inappropriate. Um, so yes, non-lawyer drafters should, I think, be familiar with the rules that govern lawyers. So in conclusion, drafters are important players in the policymaking process. They're not just mere scribes. They are continually called upon to exercise their personal judgment. And the first step in curbing personal influences is to recognize them as the challenge that they are. They are frequently invited by the drafting process to make policy judgments. Uh, we all have to fight that. Um, those judgments should be made by elected officials. And they may occasionally be influenced by their own advocacy uh, agenda and uh, ever more certainly fight that impulse. So I will say that there is this constant tension between ethics and politics, where ethics represents the objectivity and politics the subjectivity. And they're like two gravitational objects revolving around each other. And sometimes one's in the ascendancy and sometimes the other. It's a yin yang or a dialectic or a seesaw, whatever cultural metaphor you choose to use. We've got to fight those tendencies and strive to achieve what may be an unattainable goal. And that is the drafter as the faithful agent of legislators and policymakers. So I've ended these remarks since the 1990s with two bits of doggerel, and I'll ask you to bear with me for another half a minute. One of these I call the drafter's lament. 
I'm the parliamentary draftsman, and they tell me it's a fact, that I often make a muddle of a simple little act. I'm a target for the critics, and they take me in their stride. Oh, how nice to be a critic of a job you've never tried. And the second one, I call the drafters revenge. I'm the parliamentary draftsman. I compose the country's laws, and of half the litigation, I'm undoubtedly the cause. I employ a kind of English which is hard to understand. Though the purists do not like it, all the lawyers think it's grand. Thank you all for joining us on this remote session, and I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you so much, David. Well, we've gotten a couple of questions into the uh, Q and A section here, and um, so I'll pose I'll pose as many as we can get to in the time allotted. Uh, and if you'd like to add a question, uh, please do so through Zoom. Uh, our first question comes from our, our friend in Ottawa, Canada, John Marquis. Is there a difference between choices and decisions? Is the ethical issue here one of limiting the choices you give to your client for decision? Um, well, John Mark, I guess that's a reference to the um, central anecdote that I started with, the um, closet environmentalist and the, um, <clears throat> the um, farm bureau. And are you going to be a passive recipient of instructions or are you going to be an active partner with a legislator? And I'm in favor of the active partner, even though it impacts tremendously the politics of the instrument that the drafter was initially asked to draft. Um, I don't think that we can fulfill our responsibilities um, unless we share aggressively, actively, the questions as they present themselves to us. And I think it's absolutely the right thing to do. I also think as per my rather sarcastic rendering of the Martineau paragraph about the ideal drafting dialogue, it's very nearly impossible. I probably subscribe to the impossibility of sharing every last choice with a client as one should aspire to do, but um, very difficult, I think, in the actual practice of uh, legislative drafting where there's never enough time to do everything that one would like to do. Uh, we have another question from Samantha Samuel. As an international legislative drafting consultant over the years, the, recur the reoccurring issue I find is how the communication between the parties is not always effective or clear to allow the legislative drafter to understand the instruction, uh, oftentimes in the absence of an adequate policy direction, mm -hmm. and in turn, how to write the bill. Yep. Legislative drafter is most times in an impossible situation with urgent timelines. Well, um, I, um, I, I think in this case, um, international systems perhaps have a better approach to the dialogue between drafter and um, draft and, and um, policymaker in that they ask for written policy instructions, drafting instructions to be prepared. That's rare in our system in Louisiana. I think it's unfortunate that a lot of projects get assigned um, orally, a drafter and a legislator passing in the hall, here's something I need, see what you can work up for me. Um, but I do think even with the drafting instructions and the degree of preparation that takes, we've all sort of witnessed people who are talking at odds with each other. I mean, they think they're talking in the same realm and they're actually uh, missing a central point. I would borrow a concept from negotiated rulemaking as a suggestion here. Um, you know, rulemaking has gone through sort of three iterations. Um, one, the agency tells you what the law is with no public participation. That's not a very good way to proceed. Two, the um, agency drafts a proposed rule and everybody comes in and argues about it and out of that adverse interaction arises the public interest, assuming everybody's equally well represented. And then thirdly is negotiated rulemaking. And that requires that before you can initiate your rulemaking process, you provoke a dialogue among stakeholders and they come in and they try to work toward consensus or something approximating consensus. 
The reason I like that negotiated rulemaking approach is because whether it gets you all the way to yes or not, and it frequently won't, it at least deals with this problem, people talking at each other, but not around the same point. It seems to me, given enough time in advance of the hurly-burly of a contested um, rulemaking process, parties can help to at least narrow the issues and be talking about the same thing. Whether that's an approach that can help resolve this difficult problem, um, I don't know. And I'll give you actually another personal problem that came from the Gainesville, Florida seminar that I first addressed this point. Somebody in the audience stood up and she said, um, you know, I've got maybe a hundred requests for drafting on my desk. 75 of them come from people that I like and they like me and I work with them a lot. And the other 25 come from obnoxious types who do not appreciate me at all. How do I keep from putting the 25 at the bottom of the pile and giving them less attention? Well, you've got to fight that tendency. Um, and um, I, I just thought that that observation about time constraints and how they play out in terms of the quality of the legislation um, uh, might be pertinent. But thanks for the question. Oh, terrific. We, uh, we have a couple of questions from uh, Paul Chang. And um, one is uh, very broad, but I think uh, one of great interest. What do you think is the most important characteristic to become successful in this job? Well, I think Drafting starts with drafting. I mean, there are many other characteristics that would be helpful, but you've just got to begin with words on a page or on a computer screen and the capable use of uh, these tools to convey meaning in ways that um, try to exterminate ambiguity, which would not be the same thing as uh, exterminating vagueness. Um, you know, ambiguity is terminally unable to answer. My grandmother might have been either my paternal or my maternal grandmother. And ambiguity, I would say, we ought always try to keep out of what we draft. Um, vagueness, on the other hand, is a useful tool. You know, I, I can say red, and we might all have different notions of what that conjures up, but it's not in the same sense, ambiguous. And generality sometimes makes it vagueness and generality sometimes make it possible to forge coalitions in a legislative or even an agency rulemaking process that might be difficult if everything were super explicit. So I, I start with, with the drafting enterprise at the center of it all. Here's a follow-up from Paul. What is the most difficult problem that you have faced and how did you deal with it? Well, I face it in a lot of different contexts, teaching students, um, um, trying to keep the subject that uh, one might easily call boring, um, interesting. Um, and I'll, um, I'm gonna ask you, Sean, to remind me of that question after I tell this anecdote. Um, uh, we were in Georgia at one time doing training, Republic of Georgia, and one of the people in the room who helped us organize the session had previously attended the Drafting Institute. She was one of our graduates. And she said, you know, I don't think I was very well served by my legal education because they taught me to draft in flowery language. And she said, I think it was deliberate because when you live in a system of rule by edict rather than rule of law, there's a vacuum at the center of what you've written and it's easier to conceal it with a lot of flowery language. Well, that was a about as political a commentary on the drafting enterprise as I've ever heard. And it certainly lifts it out of the realm of that boring old subject and makes it in a way new and, and acutely pertinent. So again, Sean, I got off on a diversion there. The question uh, from Paul is... What was the most difficult problem that you faced and how did you deal with it? Um, my most difficult problem perhaps was when I first showed up with Louisiana legislator and um, representing the Conservation Coalition, the first appearance of Louisiana's environmental lobby in Baton Rouge uh, in 1972, two years after Earth Day. I was 
bringing legislation to create a state level environmental protection agency and a right to sue that would enable anybody who saw something out there in the landscape that was offensive to them to bring a lawsuit. This was actually done in Michigan, I think, back around that time. So um, I got um, beat up and bloodied around the head and shoulders and learned an awful lot by wading into uh, a very oil and gas oriented legislature with a portfolio of environmental bills. And I have to say that um, I dealt with those challenges not nearly as intelligently as I might deal with them today, but um, gosh, what a learning experience. I wouldn't trade it. Terrific. I have a question here from one, uh, one of my former students, William Wilson. A question often heard from staffers is, how do people normally handle something like this when they are looking for a quick solution? What do you see as the drafter's ethical obligation in presenting boilerplate language to clients? Yeah, you know, you've absolutely got to find an expert who knows the um, answer. In the classroom, we tell our students that they would benefit tremendously from finding a resource person. Um, clients know what's a problem for them, but they don't always know what's possibly the best solution or the range of solutions. And for that, you need a resource person, you need an expert. Um, so I think going outside the dialogue between drafter and client is entirely appropriate, but you've got to get permission before you do that. Something else we tell our students, um, don't go talking to anybody without first talking with us and in turn with the client. Um, and the choice of an expert needs to be made as an informed decision by a client who has been told, I think we need to go consult with a banker or I think we need to go consult with a football coach. Um, whoever your choice of an expert is, the client needs to know about it in advance, needs to have some say in it, needs to understand that who you choose as an expert is likely going to impact politically the shape and substance of the bill that you're trying to complete. We have a question from uh, Winnie Suma from Kenya. As a legislative council, my client is the government. However, we are required by law to take the bills through public participation. What happens in the scenario where the public and the government want to do different things? Well, I think the problem of a drafter in a governmental context, which is where probably most of the people viewing this operate, is um, complicated immensely by the multiple obligations. I'm gonna talk about it in the context of our system in Louisiana, because it's what I'm most familiar with. And I'll use as an example, the drafter for the Department of Social, uh, the drafter for the Health and Welfare Committee, Beth. You know, Beth might've been approached by one legislator who said, Beth, I wanna help out these welfare recipients. I wanna draft a bill that will make it easier for them to take their appeals successfully to court. And she would work on that bill. And she might be approached by another legislator who said, I'm sick and tired of these people living off of a government dole. And I wanna draft legislation to make it harder for them to get the benefits. And she would draft that bill. And she would be obligated at this first and most fundamental level, not to disclose to either legislator the confidential relationship and the fact that she was working on bills that were you know, precisely oppositional to one another. Now, we move from that to my friend CB, who was put in that difficult situation of being told just add the amendment, even though it wasn't an accurate representation of what had been voted on. CB had an obligation not only to this particular legislator who was calling upon him to put an amendment in, but also to the members of the committee who expected him to conduct himself in a way that protected their prerogatives. And I'll get down to a very practical level. Um, if you're a drafter working for a committee, you better give some thought to how particularly the chair feels about your actions at any given moment, because the chair of a committee might have a lot to do with who goes on being the committee staffer. So in two minutes, I've described about five different ethical tugs on the loyalty of the drafter. And I don't have a golden rule um, 
principle that will apply in all of those cases, except to be aware of your responsibilities. You know, before you can get permission from a client to go outside and talk to an expert, you've got to figure out who's the client. You know, is it the legislator who asked me to draft this bill? Is it the constituent group that he sent me to to be guided by it? Is it anybody else? So figuring out who your client is in any given moment. And um, yes, the um, lack of enthusiasm among governmental actors for transparency, that must be a worldwide principle. We've certainly got it in abundance here in the US. And I suspect it's uh, similar in other locations. Uh, we have a question from John Ugolo. Uh, should the drafter really be the one to allocate the enforcement responsibility in the bill? Shouldn't this be included in the original drafting instructions emanating from the sponsor of the bill, especially if the bill is emanating from the executive branch? So perhaps a difference between parliamentary practice and, and uh, uh, legislative practice in the US. No, I think this is similar in both. And I usually accompany my observations in that context with the um, observation that this is such an important decision. Most legislators, most members are not going to miss the opportunity to say, and oh, by the way, I want this to be enforced by the Environmental Quality Department, not by the Department of Natural Resources. Um, but there are other instances where that obviousness is not necessarily the same. I mean, uh, the new textualists would say that where you put the new law in an existing body of law will carry with it a lot of jurisprudential baggage. You know, the courts may have interpreted the law in a given statutory section to mean something. And there might be a different court interpretation in another area. So where you put that law might not rise to a level where the legislator would object. And again, this business of the balance between regulatory implementation and statutory completeness is a decision that I think very frequently, maybe more often than not, would be made by a drafter in the office doing the draft. It could be changed later, obviously, if the legislator wanted more authority given to the administrative body to promulgate rules and regulations and subordinate legislation. But the first cut on that draft is likely to reflect the drafter's own judgment about what's the right balance between statutory completeness and regulatory implementation. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, we've gotten so many great questions. Thank you to everybody out there. But Mashari Al-Mansur uh, asks, what is the role of negotiation in drafting legislation? And what should the drafter of legislation have to do in the event that he encounters a client who has less understanding of the project uh, than the drafter themselves? Well, great question. And um, it gives me a moment for shameless commerce. The Public Law Center decided to celebrate its International Legislative Drafting Institute by creating this International Legislative Drafting Guidebook. And it's the wisdom of 18 of our speakers about various and sundry topics. Um, you can go online with the Public Law Center's website and see it. Um, one of the um, useful articles in here is written by a fellow named Lou Giesel. And Lou, um, writes about drafting and using negotiation skills in legislation. You know, when we as drafters are called upon to create a text in dialogue with a variety of players, we are essentially engaged in a one text negotiation. The example that's frequently given here again, is gender stereotype. Um, the architect who's working with a couple and what do you want in your house? And the guy, let's say, not this guy, because I'm not very handy, but one guy says, oh, I want a, a workroom where I keep all my tools. And the other partner says, well, I want a room where I can do my arts and crafts or my sewing or whatever, forgive me. Um, and um, the architect is called upon in those instances to come up with a one text negotiation, a blueprint that accommodates within a budget the needs of both parties. And 
Similarly, I think when we're drafting legislation, um, we've got to reconcile a lot of competing points of view. Negotiation skills, as discussed in the Fisher and Urey book, Getting to Yes, can be very helpful. Um, Lou comes and gives a presentation at the Institute on um, negotiation and um, mediation and arbitration and all of those different tools that can be used to uh, reconcile disputes. So thanks for the question and forgive my shameless commerce moment. And um, let's see, the, um, I think at this point, we may want to uh, wrap up. I just want to say thank you very much to David. Um, uh, enlightening uh, program, certainly. And uh, what we've made provision for is to have some breakout rooms um, for the next half hour or so, um, so that people can network and, and in some small way replicate what we do at our live conferences and get to know each other and, and get a chance to talk. So the uh, the link, you would have to sign on to the breakout rooms. Uh, the link can be found in the chat function for Zoom. Um, and with that, thank you very much for, for coming. Uh, please tune in for tomorrow's webinar, uh, where we'll have Professor Matthias Rossi um, uh, speaking and from Germany. And so thank you again for joining us. Uh, and I will see you soon.